Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the Auburn side of the Virginia Church. Uh, my name's Chris, and together with the rest of the band, we need about 15 to 20 minutes of singing. We just believe that singing brings us closer to God. So why don't we all stand for the first song? We'll open with a prayer. Jesus, we welcome you here this morning. We thank you for all that you've done for us. Thank you. 
Love's like a hurricane, I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy. When all the love is sudden, I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory. Realize just how beautiful you are and how great you are. So
his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name, for the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Lord, we thank you. We come to you today, Lord, in celebration of all that you've done and of who you are, Lord. You are worthy of our praise and our thanksgiving. So we give this time up to you, Lord, and in the as you let us. Amen. 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 Amen
uh, using, taking advantage of that and help, uh, allowing them to join with you in prayer. At this time, I'd like to dismiss the junior high group. And if you all would, just take a couple minutes to fill this out while we get set up for stage. Out those connection cards. Those are super helpful uh, as we help, uh, help you guys. Uh, if you would, just tuck those in the seat pocket in front of you. Do will engage with them again up in that bridge of the on the side, whatever works for you. Okay, here's something I need to introduce to you because it's a little bit unusual. Once a year as a church, uh, we're a multi-site church. So what that means is here in Auburn, um, we are one church with multiple locations. Here in Auburn, this site is the very first multi-site that uh, sort of grew out of uh, the Vineyard Church. And so we have uh, three or four different sites with different site pastors. Our lead pastor, John Elmer, is at the site in Syracuse. I'm a site pastor here named Amy Ray, so I'm not going to say both parts of my name. But uh, once a year, all of the sites together take about 10 to 15 minutes to complete an annual survey. Because I'm part of a larger pastoral team that helps to steer the whole church all together. So what I'm going to invite you to do in a few minutes is to actually fill out this survey, if you would. Uh, and there's our two, uh, two ways to do it. If you're regular here, this is your church. This is the place that you call your church home. You're part of the Vineyard Church already. We'll fill out a we'll lengthier version. If you're a guest, you get the short version. This isn't a place you've decided you're not quite sure about it yet. We would like you to fill out a shorter survey just to help us with the, your first impression. So we do this once a year because it helps that, that team that I'm a part of to make good decisions about how to best serve this community and the community at large. Um, there are a few things that I would like to ask you to do before we hand them out. Now, we hand it out down the rows here, and you'll, everybody will get one. I'd like you to do this. I'd like you to answer all the questions if you can, as best you can answer every question. If a question asks you to answer something that feels a little bit vulnerable, like you're not sure you want me to know your answer, it's anonymous. So please answer as honestly as you can. Good, bad, and ugly. If that's the best way, uh, I'll be able to steer what we're doing here as a part of that team. And then finally, if a question asks you to make uh, a number of selections, again, if it says please choose one, please only choose one. If it asks for one and you choose two, your answer will not, won't be counted. It'll be invalidated by the, the way that you uh, uh, work through the, the data itself. So just those couple of tips. Um, and then uh, finally, there is a way to do this online. The slides can come up here in a second. Or maybe they already have. Yeah, vineyardny.org slash survey. If you have a smartphone, you can connect to the Vineyard Wi-Fi here, and you can begin the survey immediately. If you'd like to, go ahead. I will actually speed up the processing of the data as well. But why don't everybody come who has the, uh, the surveys after come on forward, we're going to drop them in the rows. Just pass these down your row, and um, hopefully we have enough. It's a full house today, so hopefully we have enough. Go ahead and bring these down, guys. And I'll uh, just take a couple of minutes to fill them out. If you're using uh, online and you have problems, just raise your hand. Either I or one of the options will come and help you with that.
just learned that we have a secured Wi-Fi. So if you're trying to connect via Wi-Fi, uh, because you don't want to use your data, you can connect to the network, which is the W8YP8. Look for that one. That's the Wi-Fi network you're looking for. And I'm going to slowly read a 10-digit passcode twice. I'll read it slowly. So if you want to type with me, take a half a second to get there, get to your network settings, choose the network called W8YP8, and then here comes the first pass. Five. new here, I totally forgot to tell you how to do the visitor survey by paper. Flip the whole thing over, it's one side only. If you're here for the first time, you visitor, flip it over, you just got one page. My bad, I forgot to tell you that. Okay, yeah. Sure,
transition to Jorge for the first three minutes of my message, still working on a spy. With everybody who's done, just pass them to the next one. You've got a couple guys that are going to pick up, just pass them right to Sam, and then it takes back, and we'll grab those and get started. Thank you so much for taking the time to fill those out. Uh, it's a really unusual occurrence, but when we come to a weekend service and have this happen, but we do it once a year because it just helps so much to figure out uh, how we're doing. You know, how are things going, and what will we need to do to make this the best community that's following Jesus that we possibly can. So it's so important, and I really appreciate you spending your time doing that. Well, uh, I have something really important to share with you today. And uh, this is my first weekend here at the Ivy Side. I'll, I'll tell you more as, as we go along. And hopefully you can all hang around for Barb's week to get to know me and my wife a little bit better. Um, but the, the thing that I want to say to you is this. God has an invitation for you and for me right now. I grew up in a rural uh, school, rural town in Vermont, uh, pretty far north in the state. The school was 700 to 800 kids in 7th to 12th grade. So I graduated 106 kids in my class, and I was a bandy, which meant I played the trumpet. I played the trumpet in the pit orchestra for all the musical performances. I played in the marching band. We had the largest marching band in the state of Vermont. 125 kids in this marching band. We were larger than any single graduating class. It was a really big deal. Um, I, I played trumpet in the jazz band for one of the little improvisation. I played in the regular symphonic orchestra, orchestra, orchestral band. Uh, I got pretty good at it. I was the third chair in the orchestral band. And I don't know if you know what, what being in a band is like in high school, but it sort of has this like culture all to itself. You know what I'm talking about? Like the bandies are sort of the bandies. They all live together, do stuff together, and hang out, and it's kind of maybe a little nerdy. I'm li giving you insights on my character. Not to take notes here. A little nerdy, a uh, little, you know, whatever. Uh, but you know, one of the things that happened is my band leader actually created a little bit of a uh, scenario where uh, all the logistics for 125 people in the marching band could be a nightmare for him, right? You know, he's got He's got to steer this big band. He's got to make it work. But so what he did is he invited folks, to, like myself, to volunteer to do things like make copies of the sheet music and line up all the parts. And when you have clarinets, sometimes you have like four parts for clarinets. And how many clarinets in each part? He didn't do all that. He didn't ask you. So he volunteered to do it. I remember one time uh, just before our Christmas show um, at the high school, I was invited to be a part of a volunteer team, kind of sorting all that stuff out and getting ready. And I was excited to be a part of a volunteer team. I was part of a band, but the reason I was really excited about being part of the volunteer team was that I got to volunteer alongside the two most beautiful girls in my school. I was thinking, here is a shot. Both of them in this. We got to work together for like six hours one afternoon, and I'm just going to be close to them, and they're not, they're just, they're not even just the most beautiful girls in class. They're the most beautiful girls in the school. They're in my grade. They know my name. And I'm thinking, like, hey, maybe, maybe we could have some sort of connection here. So I'm, I'm super pumped. Uh, and uh, so we work, you know, we do our thing, and I'm, you know, being cool, cool back, joking a little bit, trying to build some connections. And uh, the project is done, and I've done a couple things that were a little over the top to help these two girls specifically. And uh, so they were like, hey, that was really awesome. Thank you so much for helping. You know, Christmas time. And in rural Vermont, uh, 25 years ago, they thought it was a good idea to hang a mistletoe in the lobby. I don't know why they thought it was a good idea. These two girls said, hey, you helped us so much. What if we just go over the mistletoe now, and you stand underneath, and we'll each kiss you one of each cheek? And I had five seconds to write, oh, no. And I pounds are sweating. I'm like, this is it. This is the <laughs> moment. And so, but I have five seconds, right? And I'm thinking, well, why would they offer me this kiss? Because it's not their kiss. I'm not a child. Maybe I should. I'm going through all this. Immediately, it's fast, fast, fast going through. And so I think uh, somehow all that decision making boils down to, to me saying, no, nah, no, nah, that's, 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 that's crazy. I just love volunteering with these guys. Yeah, that would be great. We have a good project. Nah, that's, that's great. No, no. I just said, right? So that was the five seconds. But for the next five minutes, they agonize. I am never going to kiss. Even one of these girls, I don't say yes. But right now, so I start thinking through that whole thing. And wondering about it, and then and I decide, you know what, I, this is my shot, this is my only chance, they're never going to kiss me if they don't kiss me with a missile right now, so I've already said no, and I decide, 
to run down the hall. They've already left the band room and stuff. That's why I'm sitting there. Thank God. So I run out. I remember running after them and saying, hey, yeah, let's, let's, let's go to the mistletoe. That sounds great. So I go to the mistletoe and they kiss me. I'm just trying to squeeze my eyes really tight, scared, not knowing what's going to happen. And, you know, and they kiss me on the cheek and then, and then they all sort of laugh. And I look back at that and I think, oh, I am so embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> what was I thinking? small groups primarily at the Syracuse site. And before that, I was a school teacher. I taught middle schoolers how to speak German. For 12, 13, 14 year olds, I taught them how to speak German. That was my career for 16 years. Uh, I, before that, I, uh, I went to college at Ithaca College. So we've got you know, long time connections here in, hey, all right, Amish, go, Amish. Uh, down here in Central New York. We lived in Rochester. Well, my wife and my kids and I lived in Rochester for a good chunk of that 16 years where I taught just outside Rochester. We lived in Victor and taught in Penfield. Uh, just a couple tidbits about me there. Uh, I lived in Germany because I was a German teacher. So uh, as a part, as part of my high school college training, I lived in Germany and, uh, and uh, uh, you know, had, had fun doing that. I, I grew up in Vermont and uh, I worked for Apple for a little while. You already know I'm a music nerd. I worked for Apple Computer for a little while while I was in there. Just kind of like the, the bio. Right there. In nine seconds. That's a little, a little bit about me. But this year, um, I am right now. I was living in Rochester. While we were living in Victor, I would drive once a week for the week to, to come to the weekend service. So I'd drive on Saturday, hang out with Chris Gore, my wife and kids, and I'd stay at her house overnight. And then we would get up and come here. I did worship here. I led worship uh, like the band did today. But I also oversaw the ministry of leading worship for that whole first year. Part of the first small group that started here in Auburn met at Diane Stelmeck's house. I saw her this morning. We all met together in that, that crowd uh, at the very beginning. So I was a part of what Auburn was doing. I had great friendship with Chris Gore. And so coming here today feels a lot like coming home. It feels like, uh, actually, I think what I want to say is this. God has invited me to come here. And I can tell as I look at all the things that he's invited me to up to today, and just how well those things have led me to this moment. Uh, I want to introduce myself. And I want to tell a little bit about my story. Not because I feel like you need me or I need to promote myself. So you guys have this great idea. That's not why I want to tell you the story. I want to tell you about myself. And I'm actually going to draw on a story where Jesus did some inviting. Because I believe God has an invitation for you yes, right. and for me right now. And my story is the story that I know. So that's the easiest one for me to tell a story about. Um, if you're here and you're just checking this whole thing out, maybe you're here and you, you're you not sure, even sure about Jesus yet. You're hanging on. You're like, I, you just got dragged here maybe. Those are really, really important questions. And that's why I'm going to spend time not just 
telling my story, but looking at the story of Scripture. My, uh, my first point is this. Uh, I have an outline, if you want to follow along, you can. A couple of stories there in a few verses. You'll see on your wall as well. My first point is this. God invites us to listen. There, see, there are three things I think that each of us can, can observe about God's invitation. And uh, this is one of them. I think God often invites us to listen. Let's read. Uh, I'm going to be reading from Luke 5. Uh, Luke was one of the guys who hung around with Jesus and did, did life with him for three years while he came to the kingdom. So he wrote a biography. We call it a gospel. It's a special kind of biography about Jesus' life. And he reports some of the things that Jesus did and some of the things that Jesus said. And here in this uh, part of the book of Luke, um, he describes an invitation. He says this in Luke 5. One day, Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, and the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. Now, this is just the first part of the story. There is more to come. But here, in the very beginning of this story, see is that Jesus is inviting people to listen. That's part of what Jesus does. I mean, Jesus has been doing that for a long time. If we look at the kind of the parts of this biography right before this moment and right after this moment, we find numerous occasions where Jesus invites people to do one thing, come and listen. I mean, I find if I look in Luke 4, uh, verses 14 and 15, it says that he taught in their synagogue. Synagogues would be similar or analogous to what we're doing here meet for a weekly gathering around, putting their attention towards God. So he taught in that place. And they listened. And so so much for my study. Uh, it says in Luke 4.31 that he, uh, he went down to Capernaum, the town in Galilee, and began to teach the people. So he traveled from his own exact location to another nearby location to teach people. In an informal way. He didn't just do it in life. He actually moved out. He just invited them to listen. It says in uh, Luke 5.17, one day as he was teaching Pharisees and teachers of the law had so he didn't just teach people like you and me. He taught people who were well educated in the things of God. People who had invested their energy, life, and attention toward understanding lots. And they were invited to listen. It says in uh, Luke 6, 17 and 18, that a large crowd of his disciples and a great number of people from all over Judea and Jerusalem and so on were gathered. They listened to him. Jesus has been invited. inviting me to come and listen since I was a boy. So when I was raised in church, uh, and what that meant is my, my father didn't attend church, but my mother did. She was super into it. Uh, she, she had a, a good connection with Jesus, and so she brought me and my two younger brothers along with us. Uh, at the time, I think it probably felt like we were being dragged. So if you feel like you got dragged today, I feel your pain. That's how it goes, right? Some of us get here by being dragged. I mean, hopefully it doesn't stay that way. It didn't stay that way. But I know when I was a boy, God invited me to listen. And this is how I know. As I reflect on that experience of growing up in the family of faith, I listened closely to the people around me when I would, when I would go to them. I listened to how they treated each other, how they talked, how they talked about God, how they talked about the crises in their lives. I li listened to that. And I, you know, I actually heard some things that were good and some things that bothered me. Uh, that's how I know that God was inviting me to listen. Because there was this sense in this trip where I was growing up a little bit of a different community than this, that uh, the, one of the main things to do was to stand on God's promises. That's a really good thing to do. I want to invite you all to stand on God's promises. Jesus made some promises to you. Stand on them. Stand firm. Live them. Let them be a foundation for you. But it felt like as a boy, in this particular context, where it was in Lenin, Vermont, that this stand on God's promises was tooth and nail, stand on a promise, no matter what's actually happening around you. But I, somehow, even as a boy, I thought, I don't feel comfortable. There was another aspect of that church community where I grew up where, uh, that, that I listened to, where Jesus invited me to listen, and I thought, something doesn't feel exactly right here. You know, there was a sense of, um, of God's purity, God's transcendence, his otherness, his vastly different nature than ours. 
was with Ezekiel. Now, we hope here that every time we gather, like we just did, to spend 20 minutes singing, the reason we spend 20 minutes singing is we believe that the transcendent, completely other, far beyond our nature, God, wants to meet with us. So when we sing, we expect that he'll connect with us. So that, that, that's a very true thing that this, this was going around in the church as a child. They were saying, pay attention to this vast uh, majesty of God. But the flavor of it was a little different. They would, they would say things like, hey, God is so pure and so holy that we should demonstrate purity and holiness in our lives by remaining separate, by being a separate kind of group, a group that is other. Not only is God other than us and transcendent and holy, we should live in a separate kind of a way. And I understood, I think those people had a really good idea, because I think what they thought was happening is if they lived a pure, separate kind of a life that was very different and distant from, from people who were not connected to Jesus, if they had that kind of distance, what they thought was going to happen was that, the, that there would be an attraction, there would be a draw. God's purity would shine through them, and it would draw people. I just don't think it worked. I mean, they were trying. I think they really were trying, but I just don't think it worked very well. What happened was they ended up feeling just separate and different. And those people uh, who were not part of that group felt outside and other. And I can tell you that God was inviting me to listen. He has been inviting me to listen for my whole life. Because I know, when I came to the vineyard, I discovered something that was already inside me that I didn't have language for, that I didn't uh, adopt because I came to the vineyard, but I felt, yeah, that's what Jesus was telling me. That's what he was inviting me to listen for. We are a come as you are and beloved church. That is the atmosphere. That's the, the attitude that we have. And we still expect God's otherness to break in, but that's the different thing. We are saying everyone, everyone, Because that's the attitude we think God has. I mean, God, actually, because of his otherness and because of his love, he reached in grace and mercy to rescue me and you. Some of you. I mean, uh, he had to become a joy and be loved. If I was that scrunchy looking kid from Vermont who had a mullet before, it was cool, <laughs> and took the kiss from the two girls, like, what? God still invited me. He invited you. I mean, hey, he's got to be coming as you are if we're all here, right? Come as you are is something that God has been asking me to listen for for my whole life. God invites us to come and listen. My second point is this. I think God, if he's invited you to come and listen, often he asks you to take a next step. He often suggests to each one of us in an invitation that we should come and learn. Come and listen. Um, you know, I told you that I was uh, a student at Ithaca College, and that was shortly after I had really turned my life over to Jesus and given him the steering wheel of my life. So in my early college years, one of the things that God invited me to do as I was learning along the way was to pick up a guitar and try and lead worship, to sing, to sing songs, and, and, and really I think, you know, uh, you already know I'm a music person, and um, you may be able to tell I'm pretty extroverted, I don't mind talking lots, and I talk lots. So it was easy for me to connect with people. And, but actually what happened when I was doing this thing of worship wasn't lots of connecting with people. It wasn't really just playing lots of music. What was happening was God invited me to learn how to connect with him. How to connect with him one-on-one. -on -one. You know, in a way that was uh, very different from the relationship I might have, any other relationship I might have had. He just invited me to experience him one-on-one. -on -one. And then as he taught me that, as I began to learn that, as he said, come and learn how to connect, he actually helped me figure out how to help other people connect. So that's where the leadership came in. And I led worship in that, that uh, small group that we had in college, a small group of 20, let's say, at a college fellowship group. And then uh, shortly after finishing school, my wife and I moved to Virginia, where we had both of our kids. They were both born in Richmond, uh, Virginia area. And so uh, for the, the three or four years that we lived there, on the third week that I went to that church, they asked me to participate on the worship team, and a few weeks later I was leading the worship ministry, and I led it for those three years. God invited me, he asked me through this experience to learn, and then I came here and did worship at Auburn, I did worship in Victor for 
for about six or eight years and came to New York where we lived and learned a lot there. God invited me to learn a lot about how to connect with him and how to help other people connect with him. How to do that. And what it means to be a guy, I'm a guy, and have an intimate relationship with God. What does that mean? He must have needed a lot of time. I've been leading worship for 20 years. He's had to help me figure this out. One step at a time, over and over again. I've been leading worship for a Syracuse site for basically once a month for the last four years that I've been there. And so this thing of come and listen was followed by come and learn. And I think God just used, he may do this for you too. He used my passion, my interest, my ability in music to just tug, tug at me. Hey, come on, come on, come on. And he didn't need to teach me more about music. What he wanted to teach me was more about his heart. He taught me that along the way. He said, come and learn. Maybe, maybe he's saying, come and learn for some of you. He, he did this for these guys. These guys I'm talking about, fishermen, a little while ago. And if we look back at Matthew, uh, Luke 5 here, uh, it says that uh, when he had finished speaking, so we remember Jesus was speaking. First he spoke to a large crowd on the beach, and he gets in the boat. Puts out a little bit and speaks to everybody. Imagine these fishermen all sitting there hanging out listening. It says, when he had finished speaking, I think it was verse 4, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Now, I don't know if you caught the whole scene here. I'm going to take a picture one more time. These are professional fishermen, right? People have committed their uh, energy and their life towards being a fisherman. And they fish all night. And this is what he says to them. He says, uh, Master, We've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. So, so they've been fishing. They've been fishing. I don't know if you've ever gone fishing or hunting or shopping, if that's your uh, uh, bagging animal of choice. You know, you, you've been out, you've been out, and you've been on the hunt, and nothing, nothing resulted. You know, you're like, man, all my time and energy spent, and I didn't, didn't get what I was looking for. So far, they have to agree these guys did. So add another layer to this, right? Okay, they're not only frustrated that they didn't catch anything all night. This is their livelihood. They're probably thinking as they're tying these nets back together. They're thinking, I could go out and eat those fish. I didn't get some fish. They gotta sell the fish. Right? They're not gonna eat all these fish. They're gonna catch fish. They're gonna sell them. That's how they're gonna feed this. That's how they're gonna build their home. That's how they're gonna invest in their children's future. Maybe educate the kids. Could be anything. You know, all of that. All of that is hanging in the balance because they're, they haven't caught any fish. It's not just out for a recreational trip like you and I might go do. They're thinking. All these depressed thoughts, they're frustrated. And this is teacher. This teacher sitting in the boat, sitting there relaxed. He caught on the beach for a while. Oh, for him, yeah, he was hanging on that boat. So now he sits in the boat. He's sitting in the boat teaching. And then he, this guy, the rabbi, the guy who does church stuff, says to the fisherman, put out into deep water. Imagine, dear fisherman, what you'd be feeling at that moment. You're like, you can't hear that. I gotta find something else to do to make money today. My kids are gonna eat tonight. I'm not going out now. Nobody catches fish in the daytime. But Jesus invited them to come and learn. So, um, Peter says this. Simon Peter says this. Uh, we worked hard all night and haven't caught anything yet. Because you said so. And when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. Okay. Jesus invites them to come and learn. Now, he must have known something about fishermen, right? He's been talking all morning. And they've been frustrated, and maybe they had a half minute towards him. Maybe like you, maybe you've had a half minute towards me. I don't know. Maybe you're listening and you're thinking, eh, whatever, whatever, great, great, great. I can, I can listen. There's only so much you can get from listening. There's only so much these guys can get from listening. So he said, take some action. Let's go. Come on, let's learn by doing something. He invited them, and they experienced his power and his provision. Think about that, right? How the mood must have changed in those boats. It's not a little fish. It's not enough fish for today. They hit the jackpot. They're going to sell these fish? That new table I was going to build for my wife? You know, yeah. She wants a new tapestry or rug on the wall? Oh, yeah. She's going to be so happy. This is going to be awesome. The kids are going to eat three weeks straight. 
tell you about a bunch of the ways that God has invited me to, to come and learn. But I, mean, I can tell you how the, in detail, how that year in Auburn when I was here really connected me to Chris and to some of you. I, I can tell you uh, all the details that I learned when I was in Victor uh, as a church that began to fail and fall because of a pastor's indiscretion, sexual indiscretion, unfaithful to his wife, uh, caused that church to shrink from about 100 down to 30. My wife and I were there helping people doing pastoral care, helping people to get healed and find a new place to worship, whether it was Wood Baptist or another. I could tell you stories about how God has invited me to come and learn along the way, but I don't want to tell you all of them now. It's too much. There's too much. Suffice it to say that I think God has had an invitation for me to come and listen and come and learn. And I think He has that same invitation for each every one of you. I think it's there. I think it may take us a little practice. For some of us, it means looking backward and asking, what has been God's wish for me? For some of us, it means asking now, God, what are you saying? What are you inviting me to do? Let me tell you about uh, my third point. This is a little bit, uh, I want to get to it here. This is probably my favorite point. And I think this is something that most people don't, don't ask about themselves. I want to ask you to consider it for yourself. The third thing that I think God often invites each and every one of us to do, is he may be inviting you to listen, he may be inviting you to learn, but I think God invites each and every one of us to lead. That's my third point. I think God invites us to lead. He's invited me to lead. I remember one of the first times, you know, we, uh, as a vineyard church, we have a few sayings. One of them is that we, we try to live naturally, supernatural lives as we pursue Jesus. So the supernatural is God's inbreaking his influence breaking in in a way that cannot be explained by the circumstances or evidence or, or any of that. And the natural is us. It's, it's us putting our, our hands to whatever it is we feel like his assignment might be. We kind of live naturally supernatural. Well, to illustrate that, let me tell you about a time when God invited me to come and learn. Uh, one of the first times. So I'm, I'm in college, right? I'm down in Ithaca. And I'm trying to meet lots of people because that's, I think, that way God wired me. Trying to meet people. And uh, I, we, I meet a guy uh, named Lorenz. Buddy of mine became buddy for years now. Uh, he, he was at this college fellowship group. He had come as a freshman. I think it was maybe a year or two ahead. I'm not sure. And so, you know, he tried to enfold him into their fellowship group. He had to help him stay connected to Jesus. He had people around. And um, he was really brand new. I mean, so we're talking like maybe the first three weeks of, of his college career. And so he, I've gotten to know him. You know, I've, I've learned his name. I've learned something about him that I can remember to ask him later. I've learned maybe some, someone else I could connect him to, a third person I can connect him to, try to find those three things real quick, and, um, and uh, catch up with his story, like help him to, to tell me his story, tell him some of mine, hear some of his. And uh, so again, for three weeks in, maybe three weeks in, maybe in a year, and it's uh, kind of Friday night, and um, uh, some buddies of mine, uh, of mine people who were, have, have the like mind, were, were like minded with me, and were thinking, Jesus is inviting me to learn, inviting us to lead. Um, we were thinking this. We didn't have this language. We were thinking, yeah, it feels like God's asking us to do something. Let's wander around to all the frat parties and see who we can meet. That's what we thought. Because you know, that's what college kids do when they think they're answering Jesus' call. Right? So we, we go around all the frat parties. Uh, we're not drinking. You know, we're, we're totally cool with that. We're like, you know, let's, let's walk around with people. We've got the Bible in our back pocket. Real small, so it's not super obnoxious. But it's like walking up to you to meet. Lo and behold, on the edge of Ithaca College's campus, there's our campus. We're walking around see this friend of mine, Lorenz Sermon. I've known him like 10 days, right? So like, he's got he's got a red solo set. Mm -hmm. He's standing there in his, his button-down shirt and his slacks. And he's kind of ho hum standing there. And he sees me walking towards him. His eyes are like sunk. <laughs> and the cup goes behind him. I think I can see I think I can see something falling to the ground there. And as I get closer, I can just see his whole body is just agitated. He's like uh, what do I do? I don't know if he threw the cup or ate it. I don't know what happened. <laughs> but I get it there up to him and I say, hey, Lawrence, how you doing, man? And we have this conversation. And he he is not that connected to Jesus, I come to learn. You know, he tried out this Christian fellowship group. He's checking out this other group, right? Now, some of us are in that place, right? You know, we're here, we're here, we're checking and trying to figure out what Jesus is saying to us. But we're, we're also somewhere else. He was in two places. And because the 
Holy Spirit nudged me. I think it was a supernatural thing. I think the Holy Spirit actually literally did save me. I put my natural mind in place and said, hey guys, what can we do that would be good to you know, try and help move the kingdom of God forward? And I think the Holy Spirit said to us, I think I don't need him to say it to me again. I, don't need to, I would be recommending it. And he said to us, go find the fat boy. Go where the kids are hanging out and go to my friend's camp. I think the Holy Spirit told me that. Why else would I end up with Lorenz Herman in front of me? I mean, he's there. He's there in front of me. And he doesn't just react to anxiety and fear and embarrassment. I let him off the hook. I didn't try and enter one base to him or pull out my Bible or wag him or anything. I just said, hey, what's going on? What's this deal? He's going and connecting with people. And I tried to say something. I don't know what, but something like that. Very simply positive for him. And um, I just watched his anxiety sort of drip out of his body. And he sort of, I think he was embarrassed. But I don't think it was only a sense of shame that caused him to know. I think he sort of felt like, Jesus invited me to come and lead. Now, leading meant for him that I connected with him in that place and, and invited him to connect closer, to come closer to Jesus. And what happened, I mean, this is exciting. What happened is very shortly after that,